Good morning. I'd like to call to order the uh, Human Resources Appointments and Equity Committee meeting. Today is Tuesday, February 20th. Council Clerk, will you please call the roll? Calling the roll, Ms. Brown. Present. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones is absent at the moment. Mr. Miller? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. We have a quorum. Let the record reflect that Council Councilman Schron is also in attendance. Thank you very much. And uh, <coughs> Councilman Jones uh, sent a message. He is en route. He will be a few minutes late, so we will look for his arrival shortly. Um, do we have any public comment related to the agenda? No, no one has signed in. All right. May I have an approval for the minutes from the December 5th meeting? It's been a motion to move. Is there a second? Moved and second. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The minutes have been approved. Um, as you can see, we have a pretty uh, heavy agenda today. So we're going to start with the um, appointments. I respectfully request those who are present give us a brief overview of what it is that you would like to, um, what it is you would like to serve on this particular board. I'm not sure that we have anybody from the administrative side to give us an overview today. Um, we may defer to the law department just to give us a little bit of background on the positions that are before us. I understand item A, Sam Thomas III, who was um, who is to serve on the Western Reserve um, Board of Trustees for the term starting January 28th, ending December 2020, um, is not present today. But uh, the committee has, should have a letter referencing his skill and his desire to uh, continue to serve on this uh, committee. So I respectfully ask if you if there are no objections that we move to approve his appointment um, to serve on this committee. Excuse me, Madam Chair, would you like me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. Resolution number 2018-0022, confirming the county executive's appointment of Sam Thomas III to serve on the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging Board of Trustees for the term 1-1-2018 to 12-31-2020. And just quickly, is there any comments from the law department with regards to this uh, position? They're not. Okay. They, all right. There being none, um, I'll make a motion. Yes. Yes, Councilman. Is this an appointment as opposed to a reappointment? This is actually an appointment. And again, you have he's uh, provided us with a letter and outlining his uh, service and desire, his experience and his desire to serve on this committee. Any other questions from the committee? There being none, is there a motion to approve Mr. Thomas's uh, role to serve on on this board? So all right, there's been a motion. It's been moved and second. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right, thank you very much. Our next item on the agenda, would you please read it into the record? Resolution number 2018-0023, confirming the county executive's reappointment of A. Stephen Dever to serve in his official capacity as representative of Cuyahoga County on the Lake Erie Energy Development Corporation Board of Directors for an unexpired term ending 4-30-2019. And I understand there's someone here who'd like to speak on his behalf. If you please state your name and your uh, position for the record. Yes, I'm Stephanie Charlie, Department of Sustainability. All right, and is your green light on? No. Okay, there okay. we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, Stephanie Choi with the Department of Sustainability. Um, and on behalf of the department, we'd like to support Executive Budish's recommendation for Steve Endeavor to be reappointed to the LEADCO board. Um, Steve has been involved in LEADCO since its formation, and as a fun fact, he gave LEADCO its name. Um, and he has extensive knowledge of the wind industry and carries the vision of bringing it here to Northeast Ohio. Um, Stephen will especially be crucial as the Icebreaker Project moves into its um, implementation in the near future and in evaluating opportunities for continued projects and growth of the wind industry here. Um, we're confident that Stephen will be valuable and irreplaceable as a board member, um, and we highly support his reappointment. Thank you very much. And Mrs. Uh, Stephen, if you would please give us a little bit of background about yourself and why it is you'd like to uh, serve, continue to serve in this capacity. Sure. Thanks, members of council. I've been involved with the offshore wind project since 2006 when Cuyahoga County with the city of Cleveland, Case Western Reserve, and the Cleveland Foundation put together the feasibility study to look at advanced energy as a economic development opportunity for the region. Uh, since that time, we have made great progress. We are uh, scheduled to be before the Ohio Power Siting Board this spring 
for the final approval for the wind project. And uh, um, I guess it's a lesson in persistence to keep on pushing. The industry is evolving and advancing. If you look at what's taking place in the uh, East Coast, most notably New York State, as far as their ambitions to develop offshore wind, um, I think that uh, the vision that this county has had is going to prove beneficial as far as uh, creating economic development opportunities here in the region with offshore wind. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? Okay. Well, I, um, I've had the privilege of working with you in other capacities, and I know you bring an extensive level of professionalism, and your desire to continue to serve in this capacity is equally supported by myself. And so um, with that said, I'll make a motion for um, your approval. Do I have a second? That's been moved and seconded. If there are no further questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Clerk, if you would kindly read the next item into the record. Resolution number 2018-0024, confirming the county executive's reappointment of Lisa M. Hunt to serve on the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities for an unexpired term ending 1-31-2022. Thank you very much. Is there anyone here to speak on behalf of this uh, appointment? Yes, thank you. Chuck Correa from the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities on behalf of Kelly Petty, our superintendent. Just like to say some words in support of Lisa. Uh, number one, this is her second four-year term. Uh, currently, she's the vice president of our board. In the previous four years, she also served as recording secretary. She is employed by the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District as a family engagement specialist. This really gives us insight, the board insight, into the type of needs and services school-age children need, especially those approaching graduation from high, from high school. Um, her son, Jordan, is eligible for CCBDD services. He currently attends, I think, Heights High. And he'll be graduating in the future and probably look for employment services from the board. She is very articulate, very positive. She is an excellent uh, representative of the Board of Developmental Disabilities in the community. And again, the board would support her appointment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, and Ms. Hunt, if you would like to share with us a little bit about your background, why you'd like to continue to serve. Yes, good morning. Thank you for your time. Uh, I am the mom of two special children, one being exceptional. He was born with a brain abnormality called agenesis of the corpus callosum. Um, much of the research says he's his own case study. So mm -hmm. what we do for Jordan will determine his outcomes. Having the level of support that CCBDD has provided us gives uh, a, an opportunity for parents to have sort of a window of what it may look like down the road. You don't often have the opportunity to look at the team five years down the road, but when you have services like the county board provides, it does give you a little bit more support and understanding that the outcomes are far different than what we've expected in the past. And if it wasn't for the advocacy of families and really finding out what we needed to do to make systems change and really look at individuals for their humanity and not for their disability and challenges, we can help move mountains and work with collaborative efforts to make sure systems are integrated and students and children like my son have a better life. So it's an honor to serve. Awesome. Well, we thank you for your willingness to serve in this capacity. Um, as a mom um, with a, a child that is eligible for the services and received the services, what would you say is some of the challenges that you, you think we could improve upon? I think it's the coordination of services. There seems to be a sort of, you know, in the public schools we have them now, and then we sort of pass them off to, to look at post-secondary outcomes. I think we're doing that at the county board to have more push in into the high schools and even middle schools to say we can prepare our students and individuals in a much better way so they can participate in competitive environments and find what their potential is and not focus on the disability. I tell the story that when a county board member of DD is at the table for something like an IEP meeting or a team meeting, they have a, a human uh, uh, person-centered approach. And it really enables them to look at the individual and say, what do you want to do with your life? How can we better prepare you? Much like we would want for every student. Mm -hmm. So I love what they bring with this, the whole person approach, a very person-centered approach to find out what are the strengths and what are the challenges in a, in a very unique way. 
Okay, excellent. Um, are there any questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? Councilman Miller. I have a, I have a question for for the DD board as as to uh, if if Ms. Hunt is being reappointed, why why would she not be reappointed for a full term? How does it occur that she's being reappointed for an unexpired term? Her initial appointment was for someone that was leaving the board. That's why her, her term will be a full four-year term. Normally, appointments have to be made by the end of November. But in her case, because her actual initial appointment wasn't finished until, I think, the end of January, that's why her appointment came now. But it will be for a full, almost a full four-year term. OK. OK, Councilwoman Conwell. Hi, this is for Ms. Hunt. With the board uh, moving out of the business of providing um, services directly, how did, that, how did that make you feel, being a mom of, of children that need the services? I always say that the landscape has been shifting. The expectations for people with disabilities is, is shifting. And I think there is um, a, the potential to look case by case and find out how those services can be coordinated. It was, it's scary. It's always scary when you think that the rug will be pulled from beneath you. But I think what we're doing is preparing individuals and still providing services. And then I think it's also about working together with the families and finding the best way uh, for, for individuals to thrive. Are your children at currently at a workshop? No. Okay, I have my 16-year-old my still in, 18, he's still in high school. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? Okay, and in my haste, we may have to go back to items A and B, but while we're on C, um, um, is there a meeting coming up? Can this go three readings, or do you need a second reading suspension? We have a meeting coming up this Thursday. So this will need to be under second reading suspension. Well, by law, she can, she continue, can to serve. continue to serve until an appointment is made. Okay. All right. We'll move it under second reading suspension. I'll make the motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. If there are further, no further questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, items A and B, uh, was there a need for second reading suspension on either of those? Otherwise, we will move those under three readings. Well, there's technically nobody here from the executive at this time, so... And, I mean, you could leave it open if you like, or or you could proceed. Okay, since we've moved them, we'll move them, continue to hold them in, under three reading suspensions. If there is a need to amend that, we can make the amendment, I, um, I guess, during the council meeting, which will take place on February 27th. All right, thank you very much. Item D, please, if you will kindly read that one into the record. Resolution number 2018-0025, confirming the county executive's reappointment of Yvette E. Two to serve on the Cuyahoga County Audit Committee for an unexpired term ending 12-31-2021. And is uh, Ms. E. Two present? No? Mr. Carroll, will you be speaking on her behalf? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Okay. If you'll state your name and your, your position for the record, please. Uh, Matt Carroll, uh, Chief Economic Growth and Opportunity Officer uh, for the County Executive. Um, just wanted to speak to this reappointment. Um, Ms. E2 was appointed by Council in September of 2016 um, and filled an unexpired term. This would be for a four-year term ending in 2021. Uh, Yvette has a long uh, base of experience in financial management and finances. She was the uh, finance director at Lakewood. She was actually the CFO at Cleveland Public Power when I worked with her. Uh, she's currently with the Greater Cleveland Partnership, but a very, uh, very skilled, experienced, credentialed person. She's an attorney and CPA as well, uh, highly qualified for the audit committee. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns regarding this appointment, Mr. Miller? Yes. Uh, the term that that Ms. E2 was originally appointed to, that term went from when to when? She was appointed in September 2016. I believe the term ended at the end of December of 2017. So there's been a, that's, that's when her term officially ended. I, I don't know if she's been serving since then, but uh, this, would, this appointment would begin officially 1-1-18. So... Is this being called an unexpired term because the new term has already started? Is it? 
it's not my understanding. Maybe Law could speak to it, but I, I think it's just a reappointment to a full term. That is my understanding. Yeah, I I think this language is a little bit confusing. It, it usually when I think of someone being appointed to an unexpired term, they're coming in new to replace somebody who left in the middle of their term, and this doesn't seem to be the case here. She was on the board before, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. And if um if I if I am uh, under the correct mindset, the uh, ORC provides provisions for some committees to um, for the members to continue to serve until the appointment is filled, and perhaps that is the uh, situation here, Councilman Miller. So, um, are there any further questions, comments, or concerns? There being none, is there a motion to approve Ms. E 2s reappointment? It's been moved. Is there a second? And, it's been and, moved and second. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns, Mr. On, Miller, then. yes. Uh, since this term is already in progress, I would recommend second reading suspension. The motion, would you would you like to withdraw the, the, the motion in the second? And um, the mo motion to move under second reading suspension by Mr. So Miller. Moved. Is there a second? Yes. All right, it's been moved and second. Uh, the second from Councilwoman Conwell or Mr. Gallagher, however you'd like to do that, Ms. Johnson. Uh, no questions, comments, or concerns. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you very much. This will move to the full body of the council for the uh, February 27th meeting. Our next item, um, Council Clerk, would you please read it into the record? Resolution number 2018-0026, confirming the county executive's appointment or reappointment of various individuals to serve on the Cuyahoga Regional HIV Health Services Planning Council for the terms as printed on the agenda. Okay, thank you very much. I understand we have a presentation relative to this particular, uh, to this particular item on the agenda. And I've... My uh, mind is right, Mr. Allen, if you'll, if you'll identify yourself for the record and uh, share with us your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. Uh, we have with me today, I'm the co-chair of the Ryan White Planning Council, which serves a six county area here in Northeast. With me today are uh, two of the uh, appointments, uh, Christy Nichols and uh, Marilyn Robinson Statler. <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergy uh, voice is creeping up on me. Uh, they are here for a, a three-year term uh, for an appointment, and I wanted to spend just two minutes. I'll forego the slides given the given the um, time constraints. It's okay. We're prepared okay. for the slides, so that's fine. I'll be brief. Okay. Um, but I wanted to give you a few minutes on on the uh, the work that Ryan White's doing, the important work that we do in the in the um, in the region here. So we serve almost 3,100 HIV uh, positive clients in the, in the six county area. Um, these folks are either uninsured or underinsured, and uh, they're not covered by programs like Medicaid and Medicare or private insurance. And the idea is to make sure that the clients are healthy and they achieve the medical outcomes. Um, and I think there's some actually some pretty remarkable uh, medical outcomes for folks that are in care with Ryan White that, that we'll talk about in a moment. Some of the services that we uh, are involved in through the Planning Council responsibilities that uh, Christy and Marilyn are involved in are uh, the policies and procedures which are dictated by the Health Resources Services Administration, uh, assessing community needs, allocating resources. The Board of Health serves as the administrator uh, of the grant, and the idea is to assure we have good service coordination for a range of services for folks that are living with HIV and AIDS um, uh, in terms of uh, gaining access, comprehensive planning, and the administrative mechanism is assuring that our interaction with the community, there's a very strong community engagement component to this work. Uh, the requirements uh, at the federal level are that 33% of the folks that are on the Planning Council are living with HIV and AIDS to assure that we have a strong community a voice on council, and it's, it's been very active for many years, and I, I believe that we're successful at achieving that as well from the, uh, from the Planning Council activities. And 75% of the service funds uh, are used for core medical, and 25% are for supportive services. If we look at the epidemic profile for HIV in our region, uh, there are about 5,200 uh, people living with HIV and AIDS in the uh, six county region. Of that number, about 86% are uh, residing in Cuyahoga County, and of that total, uh, almost 3,500 reside in the city of Cleveland. You can see the uh, map here that shows the uh, geographic distribution of people living with HIV and AIDS in the region. 
if we look at client serves against the reflectiveness data that we provided to you in, in, in your packet, uh, about 75% are male, about 75% of our uh, council members are male, about uh, almost 60% of clients are African American and 75% of our uh, council members are African American and you'll see the poverty statistics and about 55% are, uh, are uh, within the category of men having sex with men, 41% heterosexual and 5% are IV drug users. These are high risk from the IV, IV drug use standpoint, high risk uh, and so care is very critical and assistance is critical um, to assure that services are provided and, um, and uh, care is, is provided. If we look at uh, the range of services, most of it's medical, you'll see there's a huge need for oral health services. In fact, we were able to uh, get additional funding, about $630,000 from the State Health Department of their unspent funds to provide a subsidy for medical services and oral health services. That's a first for us and we're excited um, to uh, be able to provide the additional medical services. Medical transportation is a great need for folks living in poverty and additional support for health insurance subsidies. So this is something that we're very proud of. Uh, health and Human Services has uh, told us uh, that people living with HIV who take HIV uh, medications as prescribed and obtain and keep an undetectable viral load have effectively no risk, no risk of transmitting HIV to, uh, to their HIV negative sexual partners. And we're particularly proud of the work in Ryan White. And looking at our numbers, we know that 85% uh, of the clients we serve are basically have viral suppression. And so we track that number. 58% is the national average. Ryan White is extraordinary in the care people receive here. It's extraordinary at uh, keeping uh, viral levels below detectable levels, below transmittable levels. And that's something that we see nationally with Ryan White, which is above uh, the, uh, the, the uh, national estimates of those that are not part of the program. So that's something we're particularly proud of. Lastly, you'll see a range of, of, of uh, uh, services in terms of those diagnosed in numbers. Our clients of those diagnosed, the difference between the first bar and the second bar are specifically uh, folks that are uh, in private insurance or some other form of care uh, in terms of the total number of folks that uh, are uh, living with HIV and age in the region. And then you have the percentages on linked care, retained in care, the antiretroviral use, and then the viral suppression data. So these numbers we're very proud of. Uh, Christy Nichols and Marilyn uh, Robinson-Statler are here and have been longstanding, very active members on the committee. Uh, we have a, a very spirited discussions in Ryan White. Folks are very dedicated to the work. And so I will, uh, with that, uh, step back and, and allow them with your pleasure to uh, uh, provide a couple comments. Well, thank you so much for having us today. Um, I feel very blessed to have the interaction with Ryan White. I've been attending their meetings since October of 20, I mean, sorry, August of 2016. Um, providing Medicaid updates and that. Um, and so I think we can only further that partnership and that sharing of information. It's so important to make sure that everyone is aware of the services that are available in the community. And so one of the things um, that I feel that I bring to this group is sharing how to get access to additional services through Medicaid. Um, and also helping individuals overcome specific situations. I know that through the interaction with the planning council, they've reached out to me and we've been able to help specific individuals to get care where they may not have had care previously. Um, and I look forward to continuing to working with them and helping to brid build bridges towards access. Good morning, Marlene Robinson-Statler. In the current role that Christy's serving in as the Medicaid representative, I served, I've served as the Medicaid representative since 2013 with Ryan White with Health and Human Services. In my current role as executive officer with the Division of Senior and Adult Services, we are uniquely one place that provides home-based skilled services to Ryan Wright consumers. No other entity in the county provides those services going into the homes, providing assistance with bathing, daily living tasks. Also on a personal level, I'm a member of Sigma Gamma Rho sorority and I help with our A3 um, 
current campaign, and the A3 campaign is to act against AIDS, and we work on um, processes along with education and activities around World AIDS Day. Also, because I am focused uh, really on what we call the new majority, our seniors in Cuyahoga County, and looking at some of the articles that are currently referenced, such as the New Invincibles article, which is referenced from Morehouse College, there are incident rates for HIV, and this goes along with what was already mentioned. Persons age 50 and older are 12 times higher to be either black, five times higher to be Hispanic than whites and found um, having HIV. With our new majority and our seniors, what we're seeing right now, referencing our clinical interventions, is that there's an estimate of 40 million people living with HIV in the world, and approximately 2.8 are over 50 years old. What's happening, though, with our older adults is they present symptoms similar to other ailments, such as Alzheimer's and things like that. They're infected. So we want to make sure we get the education out so that the care providers can look at the trends and look at providing care for people earlier at an earlier time. So I'm hoping with this partnership, along with the fact that a continuing relationship with Ryan White will continue to provide that education, so we will continue to have a viral low suppression and the numbers remain low. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let the record reflect Councilman Jones is with us. Also want to point out uh, Ms. Nichols and uh, Ms. Robinson Statler are two of the uh, two of the candidates for um, appointments. Before we get into questions, uh, Ms. Conwell, I just want to ask Mr. Allen if any of the other appointments are present. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gregory Ryan. Dahamel, Dahamel, did I say that right? Right, that's close. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and then Mr. Tim Leonard, I know that we did receive uh, a letter from Mr. Tim Leonard with regards to his qualifications and his desire to serve in this new capacity. He was unable to attend today, so in his absence, he sent the letter. Um, if, there, if you'd like to speak on his behalf or share uh, just a briefly, um, those who may not be here to... Uh, Yes. yes, if you would, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, unfortunately unable to attend the uh, appointments and other appointments and reappointments. Uh, certainly, uh, Mr. Leonard from the Howard Department of Health comes with a wealth of knowledge and helps to coordinate um, uh, related activity with Ryan White from the state level. Uh, Ryan Dumel is, is new. He came is, is joining our council from Astabula and is, is enthusiastic and, and willing to participate. Moving into the reappointments, uh, Naeem O'Neill, Dr. Gripshover, uh, uh, Reverend Rodas and uh, of course Marlene is with us. Uh, they've been very active uh, members of the of the planning council for many years. Have a good understanding of the landscape and the needs of uh, people living with HIV and AIDS, and have been very active in the work that we do. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Conwell for her questions. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? All right. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Allen, uh, when's the next board meeting or planning council? Our next planning council is tomorrow evening. And where is it at? It'll be held at uh, St. Augustine um, on uh, 78th in Detroit, the old St. John's Hospital. And what time? It is at, uh, it and starts, we have a range of meetings that start before planning council, subcommittee meetings, but 530 uh, will be planning council. All right, and um, presentation at the HHS of Future presentation in regards to this? We think? would really appreciate the opportunity. Would you guys be ready in uh, March? I think we have a presentation from Metro on the 7th, but probably two weeks later. Sure. Okay. Happy to. Thank you. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller. Madam Chair, uh, is, is the number of people infected with AIDS in the region currently going up or down? Councilman Miller, the number has been fairly stable. We're seeing the nature and the disposition of the outbreak change. We're seeing, as uh, Marilyn mentioned, an increase in African-American males. Uh, we're seeing that disposition of the outbreak evolve, and consequently, we're looking at the, uh, at the disposition of the council and the needs evolving and the input that we get from the community has to evolve to, uh, to, a, a, to be a, a appropriately supportive. Uh, so we, that is our hope, certainly, in the evolving environment that we continue to have the resources available to treat 
uh, in the evolving federal context, uh, I think people really count on these resources to, to provide service and maintain that viral suppression load so that transmission is, is reduced substantially to zero for those that are properly virally suppressed. And uh, what would be typical for the number of new cases in a year? The number of new cases, uh, that number I'd have to provide uh, uh, from the Cleveland Department of Public Health. Their specific responsibility is, is tracking, uh, tracking the um, emergent cases, the incidence and prevalence. I don't have current data available, but I can have it available for the HHS uh, hearing if that would be appropriate and also respond to you via email and with the uh, Cleveland Department of Public Health. They're responsible for the tracking countywide. And uh, final question, if I may. Uh, is the life expectancy of a person that's HIV positive but being properly treated the same as anybody else, or is it still less? I think that we are at a point in terms of the uh, medical treatment and care uh, that I would expect that there would be a uh, there would be a, some discrepancy in life expectancy. But I believe that people are living a lot longer, and I can determine, uh, based on uh, a quick review of the literature for you, what that difference is in compared to the, the average person. Uh, but I would suspect that people are living longer with HIV and AIDS now than they ever have. Uh, and these numbers, I think, uh, bear out the substantially uh, reduced risk, particularly with the levels of viral suppression that we're seeing. But I'll include that as well for the HHS hearing and in my response back to you, Councilman Miller. Thanks. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? There being none, I'd like to let the record reflect also that Council President Brady has joined the meeting. Um, Mr. Allen, again, given the, um, the, the, the load of the, 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 the meeting today, I, I did find it very important that you did have the opportunity to present this information. And as Councilwoman Conwell has requested, I think it would be um, an appropriate opportunity to, to share this information in HHS because it is the work that you do is great. And again, that's why we wanted to open the floor to be able to at least share with this body some of the great work that you have been doing. Um, so thank you for your your, your service and thank, you, and thank you for all that you do for our community. It is tremendous and greatly appreciated. Um, with that being said, um, we've discussed the uh, all of the appointments and reappointments. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns with regards to any of the appointments or reappointments to this body? There being none, I'd like to make a motion to move this item forward to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. If there are no further questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And i also like to have my name added for the record, please. Um, all right. This will move to the full body of the council. Uh, council Clerk, thank you very much. You. Um, if you will read the next item into the record. Ordinance number 2018-0001, providing for modifications to the adoption of the Cuyahoga County Human Resources Personnel Policies and Procedures Manual to be applicable to all county employees. All right, um, if we have, I think we have someone from our Human Resources Department to present this morning. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind the committee, this is our uh, first presentation. We do have, uh, other meetings prepare to follow. So we will allow the Human Resource Department, it looks like our Chief Talent Officer, Mr. Douglas Dykes, will be giving a presentation. So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Dykes. Good morning, Douglas Dykes, Human Resources. Um, I guess we're still booting up here. Uh, I, I figured I'd go ahead and give you um, a brief presentation on um, just the process in which we went through as we developed the revised employee handbook. Um, some of the, I call them deep dives that we're, we're looking at. Some of the um, information is brought here to council. Um, I'm trying to stall so we can get this booted up. Hold on one minute. Okay. So there's four general areas I want to cover. Just the handbook review. Why are we reviewing the handbook at this time? 
um, and give you some best practices there. Our goal in which we had for reviewing the handbook, um, just an overview, general overview of some other things, and then we're going to do some deep dive. And when I, when I refer to deep dive is some of the concerns that have been brought here before this council and some of the concerns that we're dealing with at, from the executive level. So why? Why should we review the handbook? Um, I will tell you it's a best practice. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the, um, the annual review as, as we move forward in this presentation. But there's a number of reasons why we review the handbook. Number one, organizations um, evolve. Things happen today that didn't happen 10 years ago or five years ago. Number two, there are societal changes and demographics that we have to address. You know, when I was at the sewer district, when I was there in the actual, um, in the, in the actual um, sewer district group. Sorry, guys. Okay. Give us just one minute. And Director Dykes, we also have our uh, PowerPoint presentations available if you want to, if I'm not sure how, how critical it is for you to have it on the screen, but if you want to guide us through that way, um, that is also an option available to us. All right. So, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay. Change society and um, demographics. So again, when I was at the sewer district, when I first walked into the sewer district, most of our wastewater operators were, were male. Um, as uh, women began to enter the workforce more readily, our policies had to switch a little bit. Um, just like our, our structure, our, thank you, our, um, our, our bathrooms, things of that sort, our showers, um, how we um, incorporated women into the workforce. So those demographics change. Another reason why we change or, or update a employee handbook is because of federal and state laws. Federal and state laws change. Federal and state laws are enhanced. Um, we have to make sure that they're applicable to um, our organization. Um, eliminating um, things that are no longer relevant. Um, you know, the, your handbook really should be looked at every five years um, and a major revamping every five years. Um, so there are a lot of things that happened five years ago, ten years ago that are no longer relevant that we have to make sure that we take out of the handbook. Incorporating practices. So there are sometimes, as most of us know, lately we've been dealing with paying of straight time to exempt employees. That's a practice that's been going on for a number of years, ten plus years. Um, it's never been codified in the handbook. So as practices begin to happen, um, as they take place in an organization, you have to be able to incorporate that in your handbook. Um, and then you have to be able to incorporate best practices. Um, there are a lot of things that we do today um, that have uh, been enhanced, and there are some best practices out there. So that's another thing that we have to do. Um, this last one, changing in um, social media and technology, is also very important. There's a lot of things that are changing as a result of technology and social media. And as a result of that technology and social media, we have to make sure that our handbooks are updated so we can protect our organization and our employees. So I talked a little bit about the frequency. 
And what's recommended by SHRM is that you look at your handbook at least every year or every two years. And you do your major overhaul, as long as there are not any huge um, changes over within that time, major overhaul within five years of the handbook. So what was our goal and our target? So I talked a little bit about, you know, why do we change a handbook? And some of those are incorporated in our goals or our target. But there are a couple other goals and targets that I want to bring to your attention. We wanted to make our handbook applicable to our audience. Um, I felt that the current handbook was very legalese. Um, and I, there, were, there were things that, as I read it, that I didn't have a full understanding. So we wanted to make it um, applicable to our audience. Um, we wanted to transition the policy and procedure persona to more of an employee handbook, a tool. Okay, and that's what a handbook really should be used for. We wanted to make it readable. Um, we wanted to reduce the number of pages. Now, although in the current policy and procedure manual, all the pages aren't com completely occupied with words and letters and things of that sort, but still there's a hundred, close to 160 pages in the current policy and procedure manual, and we wanted to change that. We wanted to incorporate the why. You know, why do we write um, guidelines? Why do we write procedural guidelines? Why do we write policies? So we wanted to make sure that we incorporated that. And again, I talked to you about best practices. We wanted to make sure that we incorporated best practices. So what was our approach? There was a small human resources cross functional committee that we put together. We had someone from our labor side. We had someone from our administrative assistance group. We had someone from our, our benefits and someone from our comp. Um, we had an HR manager that sees a lot more things than probably we see right here um, downtown um, in our location. And so we developed these policies or procedural guidelines and we um, passed them on at that point to our law department. And so we asked law and we sat down with law to say, hey, could you please review these, give us your perspective um, from a legal perspective, and also just give us your perspective from an employee perspective. We sent it out to our chiefs and our directors. We asked them for their feedback. Once we received all that feedback and incorporated most of that feedback into our version of the handbook, we sat down with the PRC. We sent the handbook, the completed handbook to the PRC. We sat down with the PRC. We got their feedback, and we also incorporated that into our handbook, their feedback into our handbook. And then lastly, of course, we sent it to council for their review. So just a brief overview, I mean, most of you I'm sure have gotten a copy of the proposed handbook. Um, a brief overview, there are 12 unique sections. Those sections include, of course, you know, the purpose of the handbook and includes a section when it comes to talent management. There is some um, standard of conduct. There's a section there for that. Um, there's a compensation and benefits section. And then there's a leave section, the times off. So I thought I would take most of my time really talking about the deeper dive, the deeper dive issues that we have been faced with, not just on the executive team, but also um, council and throughout the county. And so I want to spend the rest of my time really talking about that deeper dive. So I want to focus on four specific areas, the straight pay above 40 hours worked, um, the timekeeping, you know, we, we've, there's a recommendation in the handbook that we allow people to keep time two different ways based on where you are in the organization. Our telecommuting policy or procedural guidelines and then the executive and special compensation. But first let's draw a picture. We've heard from a lot of people you know, why do you need to introduce these things? Why are you doing these things? And when I say these things, I mean things like paying um, exempt employees beyond the 40 or 40 hours, hour for hour, or some of your executive or special comp. And I think it's important that we look at what's going on, not just what's going on in the United States, but what's going on right here in Northeast Ohio. And what I call this is like a 
it, I, I call this the perfect storm, okay? Especially when you're trying to recruit and retain the best talent. So what's happening? Inside, 23.3% of our employees can retire within the next three years. 22.3%. That's a lot of people. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says that this is the, uh, our unemployment in Cleveland. It's the lowest, lowest it's been in 16 years. In other words, there aren't the number of people that used to be out there to recruit and bring to your organization. They're just not available anymore. There are some compensation challenges. I think it was 2014, a study came out, and maybe it was 2015, that the PRC um, worked with a consultant to do that talked about the inequities. There were a number of years that um, non-bargaining people didn't get increases in the organization. The reason I'm telling you guys all this is because this impacts how you recruit, who you recruit, and if you recruit. We need to have a better emphasis on diversity. Who are we trying to hire to fill some of these positions? Are we putting non-traditional people in non-traditional jobs? And I would say, for the most part, we haven't done a great job of that. The current political environment, not just locally, but federally. You know, believe it or not, who sits in the White House gives government work a bad eye, a, a negative eye. And then the private sector, especially when it comes to compensation, what they can offer compared to what we can offer. We will never be able to offer the actual direct compensation salary, probably, that the private sector offers and some nonprofits offers. So it's important that we strategize to figure out what can we do within the letter of the law that will still make this place an attractive place to work. So let's continue with the deeper dive. Let's look at the straight time pay. And so I want to give some facts, and let's talk about why we want to go where we're going. Number one, I want to point out that I know this has been categorized as overtime. There is actual legal definition of overtime, which means time and a half. And this is not overtime. This is something that we've been doing for the last 10 plus years. And there are a certain segment of our population that we actually allow to earn hour for hour once they pass their 40 hours. Again, it's a practice that's been in place for a while, but it's something that we do allow. And so why do we do that? Well, there are some people that work an enormous amount of hours like in your HHS, your CECOMs, your hotline supervisors, they have to be there. There are people even in IT, which is not on this list, that sometimes when they're installing a new system, it takes more than just the 40 hours of that week. You have to look at the appraisers that doing the appraisal process. You can say, well, why don't we just give them the exchange time? But they can't take the time off. And so something that this organization decided to do many years ago, and we do it today, is that we compensate those exempt employees beyond their 40 hours a week. Now, some people will tell you that this is something that only the county practice, and that, that is not true. There are other government organizations that practice this. Um, there are also organizations that are not government organizations that practice it. Um, we had an interview with a candidate, I think it was last Friday, and she worked in the banking industry, and she is actually the comp manager in the banking industry. And she let us know that in the banking industry, they also practice this, paying exempt employees beyond 40 hours a week, hour for hour. Um, at the, um, their, the illuminating company, we have a comp, current comp manager that worked at the illuminating company, which 
Um, she was the comp manager there. They also practice this. So we're not the only ones that practice this. And it's not just a government thing. It goes beyond the government. And that's just from our limited research that we did. So what's the alternative? The alternative is that we could pay people more money, increase their salaries. But then we have an equity problem as we compare those jobs to like jobs in other places. What happens when they're not installing, take for instance the IT, a major upgrade? When they're just regularly working a 40 hour week or we've already adjusted their salary. So that's not a good alternative. And again, the exchange time wasn't a good alternative. Timekeeping. Deeper dive into timekeeping is that um, this organization, currently we treat exempt employees like hourly employees. You literally sign in for, if you worked at 8 o'clock, you sign in at 8 o'clock. You leave at 5, you sign out at 5. What we're recommending is not to eliminate that, but we like to give an option to groups of employees, exempt employees in this organization, that they can attest to working 80 hours within a two-week span. It's typically how it's done in, the, in not just the private world, but also in the public world. I've worked at two government organizations, and that's how we did it with our exempt employees. Most organizations don't require people to sign in hour for hour, so far as exempt. People say, well, it's an accountability. I think people can be held accountable by attesting that they work those hours. Exempt people usually are allowed flexibility in time. You know, one of the things that I enjoyed um, as I participate on the Cleveland Heights uh, Civil Service Commission and on some of the other boards that I participate on that sometimes I have to leave early. So I might not work an eight hour day that day to get to the commission meeting, but I'm able to flex my time and work. And so attesting that I've worked at least 80 hours a week helps me instead of trying to look at hour for hour. In addition, in addition, I will tell you that um, there are a lot of us that are exempt employees that we work way beyond are 80 hours a week. And so the question is, should we capture all of that, the time that we work at home, the time that we're working on Saturday? And I would say no. And I think what is done in the past, and this is just me, is develop a culture um, that says that we should look at hour for hour for exempt employees. So exempt employees don't want to work 41 hours unless we're actually giving them the exchange time or they're able to record it. They don't work necessarily, and that's not all, but I think it's developed a culture where people are saying, well, if I'm not going to get paid for it, if I'm not going to be able to um, work, uh, get the exchange time or the straight time, I'm not going to work past the time. And I think that is just something that's been developed in this organization. And again, that's not with all employees, but that's with enough of them. So our proposal is that we don't eliminate the hour for hour, but we give the exempt employees, certain groups, um, the ability to make a decision whether they want to record the hour for hour or whether they want to attest to work in at least the 80 hours every two weeks. Telecommuting. Um, when you look at telecommuting between 2000, and this is from SHRM, between 2005 to 2015, telecommuting has increased 115% in, in organizations as a whole. When you look at the millennials that are coming into the workforce, they enjoy the flexible work schedule, the telecommuting work schedule. I will tell you from a personal experience when um, most of you sitting up there knew I had cancer. When I had cancer, there was, I was, you know, I couldn't come into work after the surgery. And I was able to work when I was at the sewer district from home. I was able to, you know, I just couldn't come in until after I saw that doctor after a month and a half. But I was able to work at home and get a lot of work done. Now, there has to be a process in place to do this. Yes, we have to make sure that 
you know, we expect this and this and this from you by the end of the day if we're going to pay you for it. But there's an advantage here to the organization and to our employees if we allow certain employees to telecommute and work from home. And I'm not talking about on a continuous basis, but there are times I wanted to still contribute to the sewer district when I was at home. Through the telecommuting process, it allowed me to do that. I also want to point out as we look at surveys, especially from SHRM, one of the top five reasons that millennials say that they accept jobs is because of the flexibility in telecommuting that's offered in that organization. The last deep dive that I want to focus on is just the executive comp. And again, as, as the council chair said, you know, this is just a general overview and we'll have some additional meetings where we can um, look at these more in depth. So why executive and special comp? Well, I think that the picture that I drew when I first started talking about the deep dive, how are we gonna compete for talent? Because that's really what this is. How do we compete for talent? How do we stack up against other organizations that's also competing for talent? You know, it used to be, you know, my dad was spent um, 35 years working in the public sector. And it used to be that public sector employers competed most of the time with other public sector employers. So one person went from this city to this city. One person went from this county to the city. But that's not how the competition for talent is these days. We compete not only from other public or government employees, or employers rather, we compete with private, nonprofit. That, that's where our competition is. It's not limited. You know, I talked about the number of reti potential retirees in the next three years. That's not just here in this organization. There will be voids to filling jobs. And so the question is, how do we position ourselves where we can compete? And again, the competition is broad. It's not just other gov government organizations, local, but it's other organizations in Northeast Ohio, Ohio, Pennsylvania. How do we compete? And I will tell you, that when you look at information technology, it's rough out there. There's no way that we can pay some of the salaries that the information technology um, people are getting out there. But adding a little bit more, whether it's a sign-on bonus, whether it's extra vacation, or what we do here is allow them to have more exchange time, you'll be surprised how many people that are making more money where they are right now will consider coming to this organization. My comp manager um, recently decided that she was going to go back to private. We have interviewed a few comp managers, uh, candidates, and each of them make more than what we can pay them. Each of them make more. But the reason we have people considering, and it's just not in comp, this is in IT, this is in engineering, is because we do offer an opportunity to sweeten the pot. This particular person that we're looking at has never worked in government organization. So based on our current policy manual, she won't receive any vacation time her first year. Now this is a seasoned professional. Right now she has six weeks of vacation where she is. Her only thing that she asked, she said, look, you know, I can understand the government can't pay what I'm making right now, but is there anything you can do on the vacation? I'd like to spend some time with my family and still get paid with it her first year if we hire her. Is there something you can do? We're going to compete for talent. We have to consider these things. Information technology, 
engineer and construction, medical examiner. You know, I wish Dr. Gilson was here because he can tell you as we competed for someone that we brought into his organization. The only thing the, the gentleman asked for, he said, look, it's, it's, it's much less than what I'm making. He wasn't from here in Ohio. He said, but if you could just help with relocation. We got him here by just helping with relocation because he had other offers. You know, this is a medical strong community. We have the same situation right now at the, at the jail with one of our nurses. We can't pay her what Cleveland Clinic is going to pay. We've already made our case that, you know, you're not going to work the type of hours you're going to work at Cleveland Clinic. But her thing is that I've got three offers. <laughs> what else can you do? We don't want to offer more salary, but there are things that we can offer as it re relates to special compensation which, quite frankly, is a usually one or two time hit. It doesn't go into salary, so it doesn't compound over time. So I really do think that there needs to be a lot more conversation as it relates to executive and special comp for those very reasons. Now. I know this is a lot to take in. This handbook, I think, is 67 pages. Um, I'm sure all of you read it last night. Um, but I definitely would like to have further dialogue on those areas that have been brought to our attention. And with that, I'll leave you with a couple of quotes. You can read those quotes there. Um, this is really about change. It's about change. It's about preparing the, this organization for the future taking care of now, and it's about how do we make ourselves even more competitive as it relates to recruiting people and retaining them. Questions? I know Councilwoman Conwell has um, another meeting, so I'm going to uh, start with her. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, Mr. Gallagher. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. To the director, um, going back to slide two when you first started um, talking about the sewer district, j just, just a curious thing. Uh, you said, uh, did the pay change? You said there was a lot of changes when the women got implemented into, into the workforce. Uh, did the pay uh, rates change when the women were brought on board? No, pay rates did not change. Okay, so no pay equity. They were, they were competitive. Um, you know, we, we had a very competitive pay process at the sewer district. Um, and if you look at the sewer district's pay, um, we are probably a couple, a few percentages ahead of, of the county. Okay. So just want to mm -hmm. pay equity. My main concern. Okay. Um, slide four or page four, when you talked about the deeper dive, um, you talked about not enough people to fulfill the positions. Uh, so I know we're ca uh, college rich here. So have you thought about working with the uh, colleges, seeing what those, those people are, those students are graduating in and kind of working out a process so the people will be available when um, our workforce retires? So the answer to your question is yes. And we have a very robust relationship with the surrounding colleges including Cleveland State, Kent State, Baldwin Wallace, Case, um, and um, Ursuline. Okay, so do you think that's something that, because uh, you, you painted the picture that, you know, this is what we're facing, but if you have this alternative, I, I can see, you know, it feel, if we work it right, we will have the workforce, and I know you talked a lot of, in this presentation about attraction and and all that and what that would take with the millennials. But, you know, we also have a lot of students that are going to graduate with loan debt. So mm -hmm. they'll be looking at. So I, I just hope, you know, from my, my point that you will move toward really um, working with that. My last question is on page five. Um, 
back into the deeper dive again. Uh, <clears throat> you stated that exchange time was not a good idea, and I don't understand why why you think it's not. So you can expound on that, please. Um, I, I do think that um, exchange time is a tool. But again, as I said in my presentation, I think we're building a culture where employees that are in exempt classifications, they don't want to work past 40 hours unless they're getting something. And for me, that's not the real world, okay? And I've worked in some organizations before here. You know, typically you work until the job is done. And an organization can't abuse that but any time we're, we're, we're setting the organization up where people say, well, if I work 41 hours, I want exchange time or I want this, I think that's the wrong culture and the message to send. Now, with that being said, because of where our equity is, I understand it's a tool to help people to realize you are getting paid a little bit lower, or in some cases a lot lower, and what we're going to do is compensate you. I do believe that when the handbook is updated the next time, if the money is appropriated and we address the equity, if I'm standing up here, I would be asking if we could um, remove the exchange time at that point. But there's another factor out there we have to consider, and it's the current pay of our employees. Sorry, just wondering if, um, I'm sure there's some other individuals that are in the office, uh, still in the <clears throat> HR department, because I, I remember seven years ago when we went over the new policy handbook and we really deep dived into exchange time and why the director at that point wanted it. So did you have a historical perspective? Is there someone in the office that shared what was their mindset and what was their, their thought process? Because I know she was... Um, also a, a lawyer, so. Yeah, I, we didn't have that. I'm not sure how many people worked with Elise on the policy manual, um, but it's one thing that I would love to ask Elise, and I probably will reach out to her why she, she wanted to include the exchange time. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Gallagher. Okay. You keep uh, talking about these perks. How many employees that received perks since these perks were put into place have left, and where are they? Um, I don't have that number. Uh, we can get that for you, though. The answer is three. Okay. How many years were you at the sewer district? Seven. Women just started working at the sewer district seven years ago? No, that's not what I said. What well, I said, you, said you, had to, you had to create showers and bathrooms for women seven, seven years ago. Uh, that, that's not what I said. Okay. What I said was that there are jobs, and I talked about non-traditional employees and non-traditional mm -hmm. jobs. And you, at the sewer district, uh, there was a per particular period of time where there weren't women that were working in the sewers. Okay. When you were getting all this information, you stated that the compensation the executive compensation uh, section was a good idea from the feedback that you got. Who, who said that was a good idea? Um, as I talked to the executives that were bringing in and some of the IT people that were bringing in that were finding a difficult um, time recruiting, they think it's a great idea because it's, it allows us to allows them to consider this organization when they weren't going to consider it because of the pay we were offering. And you said we're not doing a good job on diversity. What are your numbers on diversity for Cuyahoga County? I don't have those in front of me, but I can get those. Ballpark it. I'm not going to hold you to it. It's just ballpark. If you're doing a bad job, then you should know those numbers. I, I do not have those numbers in front of me. Okay. Now, if we're going to give perks to chiefs and other folks and not the lower level employees, aren't we creating a problem here? With, with the overall culture of Cuyahoga County as being an employee and a destination place to work? I don't think so. I think that there are organizations, uh, council men, that, that offer these perks, and it includes government organizations, and it also includes non-government organizations. And it doesn't necessarily create two different cultures, 
Um, it's what they do to try to recruit and retain the best talent. I and, we, and we can't be the only ones out there that says it's a bad thing. Well, uh, and, and, I would, and I understand the competition for good people, but you do have to understand that you and I and everybody else that works for Cuyahoga County is working for the people of Cuyahoga County. And, and at a point in time where we can't compete with, with the outside world, that's just a fact of life. And if you're going to try and change things with these perks and moving and this and that, and you don't think those folks, the majority of the folks that are below the executive level, below the elected level, below the, the management level, don't feel that and don't feel like they're being treated differently, I, I, I question your expertise. So finally, you had a quote in November. We could have taken one of the two approaches and wiped out anything over 40 hours. That is not how you become an employer of choice. And there is no sense in pissing off over 50 employees. And then I read that 22.3% of the workforce is eligible to retire in three years. And I would assume that includes the courts. That's just under the executive. Right. Once again, <laughs> given the opportunity, a three-year buyout moves these people out earlier, saves the county millions of dollars, which is a fact done correctly, does these folks a favor and does us a favor by hiring new people, bringing them back in. So this perfect storm is going to hit you regardless. So I, I quit, and, and I'm not asking you for an answer. I keep pushing it. Why we don't do that, I don't know. And I don't buy the argument that we can't compete out there for good talent. Because the hook that you have, and you know it, and I know it, one of the reasons that you're here is the compensation with the PERS and everything else that government employees make, while not perfect, is better than just about anything the private sector can, can afford. Which is why we do get people willing to take less money to come here and work 30 years of their lives to be compensated at the back end. I was an employee for 30 years. I knew that coming in, and I knew the back end is where it was at. So I, I think you're, you're underselling not only people that want to work here, and, and there, is, there, there are those folks that want to work for, to serve the people. They're still out there, and I think they're still here. And I think we have an opportunity to open a door for them, bring a new more, more new people in here, and, and move in this county forward. So we have a lot to discuss here, but if you're worried about 50 over here and, and, and upsetting them, it doesn't look like you're too worried about 22.3 over here, which is well over 1,000. And I can, trust me, I was there. They're not happy. Any other questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? Councilman Miller. Madam Chair, Director, first let me say that I, uh, I applaud the effort. I think we do need the, the personnel policies to be better specified and, and to be uh, strategic and well thought out, and I think you're trying to move us in that direction. Thank you. Uh, my, my first question is about salaried employees, which you call exempt. Uh, and uh, the understanding that I had, and maybe this was from from years ago, but but the understanding is that uh, that the work that salaried employees do, it's not so much about how many hours they work, but it's whether they get the work done and, and that they do the right things and, and do it well. And, and, uh, and, and so, uh, so they're hired at, a, at a, particular sal a particular salary to get a particular job done. It's not particularly tied to how many hours they work. Uh, but it seems like we're getting away from that at, at both ends. 
because the uh, first we're asking them either, either to punch a clock or else to uh, certify that they've worked at least 80 hours in a week. Uh, and then on the other hand, if, if they get, uh, if they work more than 80 hours a week, they're going to get compensated for an hour for hour. So it, it sounds like that the old concept of, of salaried employees were, were if you, uh, if you really able to do it well, maybe you can get it done in less than 40 hours a week. And, 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 and if, if so, but you're doing the job well, that's okay. And, and, uh, and if it takes you uh, extra hours to get it done, well, you, you put in those extra hours and you don't get any money for it, additional. It sounds like we're getting away from that concept. And that, and that the uh, the exempt employees are, are just a slightly different version of hourly employees, and I'd like your comment about that. You, you know, one one concern that I might have is is that if you uh, if you pay people for the additional hours, well, then uh, I mean when you're on salary under the old concept, well, you're motivated to get the job done quickly and efficiently because you're not going to get more money. But if, but if, if the, but under this new system, the motivations are different. Like your comment about that. Uh, Councilman, I agree with you. Um, the, the whole approach to salary exempt employees was just what you said. You work and you get the job done. Um, if you had to work 45 hours, you get the job done at 45 hours, but you weren't getting compensated for extra time. And originally, and in most organizations, the organizations I've worked in, that's what you do. Um, I agree with you, we're, we're moving away from that. Uh, we're almost treating employees, exempt employees, salary employees, like they're hour for hour. And as I said before, you know, I think that where we are in our, our particular time in history with the salaries not really at where they should be, where, wherever that number is, I can understand why we moved in this direction. But I do believe that once we can address the equity and once we can address some other things, we need to really look at should we be compensated, sal compensating salary employees on an hour-for-hour -hour basis? And that would be my recommendation. We're not there yet. You know, we are where we are. But I agree with your comments. And I don't think that, you know, with me cutting my teeth in um, compensation many years ago with RTA, it's not a practice that if I were walking in here saying, this is what we should do. I would be addressing the other things on the other issue on the other side. I would also like, Madam Chair, Director, to uh, to raise concerns about how how jobs are designed. Uh, there is a motivation for an organization to. Uh, to have a smaller number of employees working 60 hours a week if you can get away with it. Because you have fewer employees to manage, you have fewer f sets of benefits to pay, there, there's, uh, there's, just, there's just advantages. And, and, uh, and I think there's, uh, there's a whole, whole set of issues around how do you determine whether uh, the duties for a particular job have been fairly defined so that a reasonable person can complete the work in a reasonable number of hours. And, and I, think, I think that issue comes into play in this. Yeah, 
I would agree with you also with that. Um, one of the things that I have talked to the PRC about is just this workforce planning. Um, how are we planning our workforce for the future? And what you're talking about will be a consideration as we look at that. Now, we won't get to that this year <laughs> um, because of the um, N4 project and some of the other things that we're doing. But we do want to work with the directors, with the PRC, to look at just what you said, to make sure that we're designing those jobs the, the right way appropriately, um, that there's not a taking advantage of the organization or a taking advantage of the employee. And I think that once we get through that process, I think that um, we're going to all be very, very uh, pleased with it. Uh, just a quick comment about executive compensation. Uh, just to say that I share Councilman Gallagher's concerns. I, I think there, uh, there are potential morale problems, and, and I think... Uh, some of the tools create bigger problems than others, and, and I, I think we got to take a look at that. Uh, in some cases, uh, we might solve the problem by using the tools a little bit more broadly than, uh, than just this narrow group at the top. And in other cases, we might solve the problem by not using some of the tools. I think we got to take a look at that. Happy to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I have numerous things, but I'm only going to do one more So, in the interest of time, okay. which is that, uh, that there are uh, things not in the policies that, that we got to take a look at. And, and, and for me, the, uh, the biggest one is, is the whole question about uh, how unclassified positions are, are set up. And uh, there, <clears throat> there have been cases where uh, new unclassified positions have been set up with their duties defined so that they overlap quite a bit with existing classified positions, leading to the classified positions being being eliminated or decreased in their responsibilities, and and I think there, I think there needs to be uh, some kind of uh, strategic planning and thinking about around that issue, so that we don't undermine the classification system. Okay, I agree. Okay, and. Uh, uh, I'll just make one other comment before I pass it Another along. Another one other is, comment? Is, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I pulled a Greenspan. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, that uh, I get the sense we're not going to do it in this round, but I think a little bit longer term that the, uh, that the personal personnel manual itself should not be codified by attachment in, into, the, into the codified ordinances. We should, we should codify just the human resources policies themselves, and then the personnel manual should, should reflect the policies that are, that are in the code. And, and I just uh, uh, want to express my interest in going in that direction a little bit longer term. Thank you for that. Um, you and I have talked about that a little bit before, and um, we are trying to prepare uh, just that, even for this term. So we're working on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it looks, the council president, do you have some remarks you like to make? Comment. Okay. Um, good morning, director. Um, <clears throat> um, the council's been waiting quite some time for this legislation, months at least, and uh, we were promised it many times, and it wasn't it wasn't here in a timely way. Um, we've gotten as far as the handbook, and this we have gotten this in bits and pieces, and um, only recently, the entire thing. I know that you have been in conversations with the council staff around these issues. I know that they've indicated to you some of the concerns that the council has 
We were a little surprised that it did not impact apparently at all what was introduced to us because what was introduced to us is never going to be passed by this council. What's introduced to us will be amended by the council as we see fit. And we will be glad and we will be looking forward to working with you and the administration in the short run over how we deal with what has been introduced. But at this point, what you really need to understand is it is in, it's, it's, it's on our plate now. And we will dispose of this. And we will, we will use our best judgment about what this is going to look like. And we will pass legislation and that will be the policy of the county. So we are at this point now where we are ready to do our jobs and we are ready to uh, define this issue in a way that will settle it and we can move forward and not continue to be embroiled in this issue for months into the future. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, I, I think uh, Councilman Schron has a couple of questions. I don't want to do a green span because there are more than a couple, but <laughs> a couple would define it as two. And uh, uh, I echo our Council President's uh, remarks, uh, echo, I think, uh, also my our Council President's, and I guess, uh, rancor uh, would be a proper term. So. Um, we're catching this in very uncomfortable times, needless to say. Uh, let's just go through a few things. Do you think that, give me your thoughts as far as the public definition of salary and salary exempt. Do you think that uh, the general population considers that to be something in which they would get either, I know you are choosing not to use the word overtime, you're using it to be paid time above 40 hours. Do you think uh, when you say salary or salary exempt, What's in the minds of the general population when you say that as far as overtime or, or additional time after 40 hours? And I don't, I don't know the general population, um, but the people that I speak to was just what I said. You know, when they say salary, it means that you're exempt and you work for a salary and you don't get paid anything beyond what that salary is. That's my general understanding of it mm -hmm. also. Uh, and if I bet you, if you walk down the street here, you're going to find that'll be the I think the general overview. How do you reconcile what your opinion and what the actions have been with the auditors that came in and said that $1.7 million issue? How do you reconcile that as far as the paid time above 40 hours? Was that in concert with what, we're, what was uh, that definition you just gave me, or is that something beyond in the, in when we got that audit? In the appraisal as far so, as the $1.7 million. And I'm not sure what your question is. What is your... You just define salary mm -hmm. as probably mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't get anything above the 40 hours. Mm -hmm. We just paid $1.7 million. Is that in agreement with what you just said, and do you think in the eyes of most people? I would say no. Okay. Um, will the recommendations that you put forth fix that going forward, do you think, so that if we were to adopt that, it would address this $1.7 million issue by being able to pay on this. I'm not sure even what, how they definite it because I'm having a hard time grabbing my hands around this concept of, of flexible time above 40 hours and how we don't start running into morale problems and things like that. But it, will that fix it if we, adopt, if we were to adopt what has been presented in total, just do another of changes, vote it, pass it, would that fix that $1.7 million issue that was raised before? I do believe going forward it would fix it, yes, because okay. it codifies it in an actual um, handbook where it wasn't codified before. What would happen if this body says, no, we're not going to do that to those people that are working the over 40 hours in the exempt or salary exempt status going forward the very next day if we vote that section down? When you say what will happen to those people, in we... regards to the county action and uh, steps and things like that, because I think you alluded that uh, hotline supervisors, HHS, medical examiners, appraisers um, were the critical components of getting this payment above, and we've been doing it for ten years. What would happen to those individuals as far as work performance in the county? Would they would they stop working the very next day on those above forty hours? I can't say what will happen to them. I mean, we'd have to ask those employees what would happen. 
I will say that based on the few that I've spoken with, that they would they would not work past the 40 hours. Okay, so we had nothing in writing authorizing it before this time, but yet we paid it. Mm -hmm. Let me just go to your specific list and just ask you to take those five categories that you identified on your, on your sheet and say they're causing the problem and come back to this body and tell us how much of that $1.7 million was paid to those five categories. That shouldn't be hard to do, I would think. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and you alluded that the bank does pay that. In this one example, I think, that mm -hmm. you alluded. Was it in the bank's manual that they were allowed to do that? I, I didn't find that out. I will have to find that out, but I can ask. Okay, so if it was yeah. in the bank's manual, it's okay, of course. If it's not in the bank's manual, then they got an internal issue, mm -hmm. but that's not a public mm -hmm. issue. That's a, that's a private corporation that's allowed to do whatever they want. They might be, might be will have challenged that in some way, shape, or form. Um, you had alluded to flexible work hours and how that's telecommunicating. And I, I agree that that's the trend. That's where things are moving. How have you incorporated this concept of telecommunicating into customer service for what I consider to be our customers, our taxpayers? How have you, how have you done that and written that into the job description if we're going to, going to be allowing telecommunicating? We haven't written anything into the job description yet, Councilperson, um, but it's something that we would be considering. How do we make sure that the customer service levels are kept to the level that we expect them to be kept to? So we're advocating a, a major change in telecommunicating. We're doing a deep dive, and we don't have that laid out. Is, it, is that something we proposed in the ERP? Because generally when you do this, it means we've changed the way we're going to do business. Mm -hmm. We're going to adopt this ERP. Telecommuting is, is, a, is a, a norm within industry. Mm -hmm. And if this, is a, this was big enough to make it on one of your big bullets on here, how have you presented that to the ERP system as to what we're going to be doing in the job descriptions, which I get uh, you said have not been addressed, but it's going to be a go forward. It's big enough to make it on our list of presentations here today. And how did that get factored into the ERP uh, presentations as we've written the job descriptions for going forward for, for the go forward portion? Yeah, the, the one thing that we have discussed with the ERP group is can we do this easily with the software? Um, and that is... The, the answer was yes, um, but there are there are other. I mean, just like with the rest of the manual, there, there's a lot more that we have to do to move the organization from where we are currently to where we want them to go if this manual was adopted. So our high level management people are going to be allowed to do that, and they're going to, but our operational people will not be allowed to telecommute. Um, the operation people, most of them are um, union. Pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them are union, and it's something that before we would tell them they would have to do, we have to negotiate that. And so before we get out there and say, this is what they're going to do, we have to sit down with each union leadership and say, here, here's what we like to do. What do you guys think about it? And it has to be negotiated. That's the main reason why they're not included here. Excuse me, Mr. Strawn. I'd like the record to reflect that Councilwoman Sunny Simon is here. Oh. How many more questions do you have, sir? Um, maybe if I, numbers, if I say three, I'll try my best to keep it there. Okay, and, and bear in mind that this is the <coughs> initial presentation and that there, while we, I understand there are a lot of questions as it relates to this uh, subject matter, we have scheduled numerous meetings and there will be more opportunity for discussion um, as it relates to this topic. So um, respectfully, if you three. could keep it to three, I'll do, I'll do I three. would greatly sure. appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, the... Uh, on your next slide, you talked in terms of special compensation, and what um, strikes me is, again, I think the same thing that was raised by uh, Mr. Miller, is that the public sector and private sector, they're just two different, two different ways of, of which, which people work. Do you also compare the retirement, which is what Mr. Gallagher talked about, but the health benefits, and, the, and all those things are just so much different. Uh, they're, they're, it's like apples and oranges if somebody wants to work in in um, engineering or medical examiner, matter of fact, the private sector doesn't really have more than likely a medical examiner mm -hmm. position. Uh, do you factor that in when you when you say that one is is fierce competition uh, when you're sitting down talking with a candidate? All that is factored in. It's, a, it's I, an apples and oranges 
analysis. It seems I would like. agree, but there are some apples or oranges, however you would refer to it, that are public sector that's doing the same thing, whether that's RTA, um, and we have the data, whether that's um, McGinn Sewer District, Cleveland Metropolitan School, um, Cleveland Metropolitan Housing Authority, uh, Cleveland Public Library, um, and Cleveland Metro Parks. Okay. Uh, I They're guess doing I, it. Uh, the one thing I was surprised seeing on your slides was that the current political environment was something that made it on your on your slide, and that's mm -hmm. making it hard for you to employ people. You've heard that? It's a consideration. When you look at the data, when you look at SHRM and you look at the data, that's one of the things that a lot of the millennials are, are questioning. Should I go and work in this organization with all the recent upheaval and things of that sort? So that's just something that the data shows. Recent upheavals where? Federal. So the recent upheavals in the county is not causing your problem? No. The overtime, the audits, the $1.7 million, the... Uh, the fact that we had all kinds of records just sub subpoenaed, that's not causing you a problem. I, I don't have any data on it. I'm just talking about the data that I have from a local um, uh, or from SHRM. Please send me that data. Okay, okay I will. Because our members are members of SHRM, too. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. All right. Um, I do have a couple of questions with regards to uh, some things that have been stated today. If you could just help us with clarifying um, some of the points that you made in the earlier comments, which was um, compensation that had been provided in the past. Um, if you could let us know how many employees that was applicable to, the type of benefits they received, and how far back that went, that would be um, that would be helpful to me, and I think also this body as well. Um, Councilwoman Baker has a question, then we'll follow up with Councilwoman Simon. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I agree with a lot of that has been said here, and I think we do need to um, take a deeper, deeper dive mm -hmm. into some of the um, issues that have been brought forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know for the, the time allotted, and we will be talking more about this, so I'll keep it short. But it sounds like, and it is disturbing to hear that you have, um, which I think we shouldn't interchange exempt and salary. I think that that can be confusing to people on the outside looking in. We should just call them salary and hourly and keep it simple so that people understand what we're talking about. Okay. When you talk about exempt and non-exempt, um, it gets confusing, and when it gets confusing, then it also creates anxiety about what it is that we're doing. So... It's disturbing to hear that you have mentioned there are a few salary employees that will not work one day over 40 hours unless they're compensated. Did I hear you correctly? Yes. It seems to me that we are creating a culture here mm -hmm. of expectations that are beyond what the norm of what is expected of an employee, salary or, or hourly, and that we are this is evolving into a larger problem because of, um, of what we have created here. Mm -hmm. So I would repeat, I think, what we've heard, and that when a, an employee is hired, and he's hired as a salary employee, he understands that that salaried employee is to get the job done, and there isn't compensation beyond that. If we feel compensation is needed because there are critical times when they can't leave, then that person should be considered hourly. And that way you can pay them the time and a half that's needed in order for them to stay on a holiday or a critical time that they can't leave. Um, but I do think that it is the culture that has been created that we are now trying to excuse uh, and explain when perhaps we should be dialing it back and going back to the simplicity of what is a salary employee and what is an hourly employee and what does the people that hire us and everyone in this public sector, what do they expect us to pay and what is reasonable? And I, I don't think it's the farther we get away from that and the more we try to explain why this is a better way to go outside of what is normally um, expected gets us deeper into the mistrust and understanding of the good work that we do here. And I would hope that you take that into consideration when we continue this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Baker. Councilwoman Simon. Thank you. Um, 
Article 9 of our charter um, asks for and requests a standardization of benefits. Are you familiar with that provision? Yes. And how is the structure you presented to us standardized when, when you have top executives at the county getting paid much differently um, than other county employees? How is that standard? How, is, how, how do you explain that? And I, and I uh, be honest with you, Councilwoman, I would have to turn it over to our, our legal group because um, I, I don't know if I can explain it. I mean, I think that is more of a, the legal terms, the legal boundaries, and I, I won't even try to stand up here and do that. Okay, that's fair. And who's your legal group that's working on this? So we have um, Ed um, is in my department, Jonathan, um, it's in the law department. Amy's in the law department, and also Todd. And and I watched part of this um, before I got here, and understand, or at least I've heard that you've consulted with stakeholders before presenting this um, proposal to council. Yes. Yes. And and I know council is a stakeholder, and share. I think there our chief of staff and our staff shared our our concerns and viewpoints on what you're presenting. Was that actually given our feedback to the executive? Did you share with the executive what our staff conveyed to you about council's position? So what we, I don't know if we shared it with the executive because I think there was some conversation that council staff had with the executive. But what we did is our process was that we would take the feedback and we incorporated most of the, I think most if not all of the feedback um, and there were, um, there was an email that was sent that said there may be some additional questions on these topics. Um, so just be prepared to answer those topics. And so that's what we did. I'm going to respect the chair's um, sensitivity to time, but I just want to be clear that you incorporated our council's um, positions or concerns in the product that you, you submitted to us. Mm -hmm even though I think council has expressed their concern about executive compensation and, and some of the provisions of this policy that we still saw when we received it. So they said they had concerns, mm -hmm. but they didn't say or recommend to us that we take it out. We sat down and we talked with them in a meeting, mm -hmm. and they said, here are six concerns that council will probably still have. Mm -hmm. So you'll need to be prepared to, to answer those. Okay. To me, that doesn't translate into take them out. That translates into be prepared to talk about them if it comes up with council. Are we the only body and stakeholder that express concerns about keeping in executive compensation packages that are in no small way controversial at this time? Um, I, I don't to me, if it was directly to me, um, there may, and I, I don't want to speak out of turn, there may have been maybe a, one or two people that might have had some concerns. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Councilwoman Simon. Clearly this is a hot topic. Um, there have been um, several concerns that have been heard uh, by you, uh, Director Dykes. Um, I, I know uh, with a, 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 a strong degree of certainty that there were some things that we, we expressed that we would like to have see, um, seen removed from the manual at this time. But as our council president has stated quite clearly, the ball is in our court committee council. The ball is in our court. So um, this is the first meeting of uh, multiple, at least three, that we have already uh, scheduled to already. So we will reconvene um, on February 27th to discuss um, the council's proposed changes. And then that will um, address any miscommunications or things that weren't clear prior to today. And so we'll have that opportunity. So um, I, I think that will certainly um, present more dialogue, but it, it, will, uh, it will address much of what was already discussed today. So if there is nothing further, I'll turn it over to uh, Council President Brady, because I know he may have some closing remarks, and then we, we unless there's any public comment, we'll address. <clears throat> Actually, Count, um, Chairwoman, you, you did a very good job of uh, summing up where we are. Um, I would only say that you know a lot of what we heard today doesn't even sound similar or familiar 
to what I've been hearing over the, over the last couple of weeks. And it's up to you if you don't report directly to the executive and let them know about something this, this is important that's affecting this administration so, so significantly. But I find that a very strange way to run the government. And on that, we will adjourn. Thank you so much.